Welcome to Word Pictures, a program of discussion and discovery. We examine the stories, events, and persons as described in the Word Pictures, presented in the 66 books of Scripture we know as the Word of God. But what kind of God is pictured here? By reading these stories, some become fearful, others adore. Yet others are just confused. Come, let us see for ourselves in an unrehearsed, no question barred discussion with people just like you as we search for the God of these stories. What picture of God will emerge for you? Let's join the discussion right now. Welcome to our discussion. We're so glad that you have joined us. This time we're going to continue our study of the most significant thing that ever happened in Earth's history. We're looking at the death and resurrection of Jesus. And I want to read from the book of John, uh, John 10 and, cha and uh, verse 17 and 18. And Jesus is talking to his disciples. Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received from my Father. Expand that one. Okay. Well, let's, let's before I expand that one, let's connect it with what happened a couple days to two and a half days earlier and the three days in biblical terms. Um, remember that Jesus died, we talked about this last time, he really died proving that sin causes death. We suggested that Jesus actually died twice, once in the Garden of Gethsemane and he had to be, he had to be revived again by the angel from heaven and then he went out and he did the whole thing over again like a good teacher would. And unfortunately, none of us were paying attention. We didn't understand what it was all about, but the universe was watching. God and all the angels and all the other beings of the universe were watching. The devil and his angels were all watching. They saw Jesus die of sin. Just as God had said back in Genesis 2, 17. Then they saw something else. Satan had claimed, well, the reason people die. You know, originally he said, no, no, you won't die. And then after I saw people dying, he said, well, the reason you're dying is because God's upset that you're all joining my side, and so he's killing you. And what did Jesus say? Did he say, my father, my father, why are you killing me? No, he said, why have you done what? Okay. Forsaken me. Why have you left me? God was not killing his son. <clears throat> but then there's a third thing that was discussed there, we discussed about last time, and that's this. So, so what if you don't understand that? Does it really matter? I mean, you know, he died for our sins, and that, oh, that's nice, that's great. Uh, what if you don't understand all these issues? And the difficulty is that you could be like the Pharisees out there killing God in God's name. Now, we realize that God couldn't die, but Jesus was God and human. He, it was the human Jesus that died. They were determined to have this man dead. And we could do the same thing if we misunderstand what his life and his death was all about. Now, <clears throat> he slept in the tomb from late Friday until halfway through Sunday. And halfway through Sunday means starting at sundown on Saturday evening, what we would call Saturday evening. It's now about sunrise on Sunday morning. And what happened? <clears throat> there were some visitors that came. A whole lot of fun things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's go through that step by step because some very, very significant things happened. I'm going to read a few passages from Ellen White um, because she fills in some details that you can imply from Scripture but may not be quite so obvious. I'm going to turn first to Desire of Ages page 782, verse 4. If you have your Bibles, open them up to the last chapters of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Or if you happen to have the book Desire of Ages, turn to page 782, and we're going to follow through here, and we're going to see some very interesting comments. When Jesus was laid in the grave, Satan triumphed. He dared to hope 
that the Savior would not take up his life again. Now remember, what, what was Satan's claim about death? God's going to oh, kill him. It was permanent. Death is his domain. He yeah. said, if you die, you belong to me. There's no, nothing beyond this life. That's, that's my domain. If you're dead, I claim you. And how do we know that from Scripture? Discussion about Moses. And yes, they, he fought with Jesus himself over the body of Moses. Remember, it discusses that in the tiny little book of Jude, just before the book of Revelation. And he just said, you know, step back. I'm taking this body. I know you claim him, but this one's mine. Okay? Why, is that, why is that valuable to him? To whom? To um, Satan. Well, let's talk about that. That's what I want to talk about next. What was, and let's review what we have said in the past. Let's just go over it quickly. What was Satan's hope when Jesus came down to this earth, starting as a child? That he could kill him. Well, but he, there was one thing he wanted to do even better than that. Get worshipped by him. Okay, and that would be, a, in other words, to get Jesus to step aside from God's step-by-step -step plan. In other words, basically to get Jesus to sin. His absolute glorious plan was to get Jesus to sin. That was his number one choice. He would have been absolutely ecstatic if he could have gotten Jesus to sin. Failing that, what would be plan number two? Plan B? Kill him. Kill him, Kill him or make things so rough for him that he would give up and go back to heaven. Okay? So plan one, try to get Jesus to sin. Plan two, either kill him, get rid of him even as a child, or failing that to get him to say, give up, go back to heaven. <coughs> okay? The hope of him sinning is because he was human, right? Yeah, sure. So he, he could get pulled away from God. Well, you know, Satan's so. claim had been nobody as a human being can live on this life beginning to end without sinning. And he had evidence for that. Yeah, well. Because the first human that had the connection with divinity, not on his own, but... Adam had a connection with divinity. When he sinned, he lost that. And his progenitors lost that. <coughs> and so he had control, essentially, of the human race. But now here comes another human that has divinity attached to it again. Mm -hmm. And now he's got to make the same thing happen to that one. He's got to separate the humanity by sin from divinity. Yeah, but Adam's connection to divinity wasn't wasn't like Jesus' yeah. connection to divinity. But the temptations Adam that Adam faced were nothing compared to the temptations that Jesus faced. I mean, you certainly would recognize that. Uh, we have degree here. That's <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, do you think that the temptation to eat the fruit when you every tree around is full of luscious fruit? There's only one that you're not supposed to eat up. Do you think that's as great, great a temptation as the temptation that Jesus faced? Surely not. Not even, not even to be compared. I, li I like what Norm says there about Adam having a connection to he the divinity, but I don't, Luke, maybe Luke, it's because I don't have it anymore, I don't understand and, it, but and, there's something there I, it's Luke hard for me three, to. If you look at, let's <clears> just look at that real quick. Turn to Luke chapter 3 to see exactly what that connection was. The very last verse in Luke chapter 3. It says, and you remember, the ancestry of Jesus starts back with verse 23. And it goes, when Jesus began his work, he was about 30 years old. He was a son, so people thought of Joseph was a son of da-da-da, and it was a son of, was a son of, was a son of. All the way down to the last verse, it says, the son of Enosh, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. Right. Adam was supposed to be the, the leader of this world. He was supposed to have, if, if he'd had a lot of children born here on this earth and he's still faithful to God in the Garden of Eden, he would have been the one to attend the heavenly councils to represent this earth as the Son of God. But he, 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 he ate that fruit, chose to stay with Eve, and lost that privilege. And Satan, Job 1 and 2, Satan went to heaven and said, I deserve to be here because I'm now the leader of planet Earth. It says right there. Well, what would it look like if Jesus would have sinned? How could you tell? 
I, if Jesus had sinned, it's, it would be my personal conviction. I don't have a quotation for this. It would be my personal conviction that the entire universe would fall apart because the beings would say, okay, God can't be trusted. He said this, you can't believe a word he says, bang, the whole thing falls apart. Well, but as we mentioned, Jesus had had some options. He could he could be here on earth and sin, or he could just say, hey, I'm giving up yeah. for this, I'm going back up. Um, but And start all over. Just create all these creatures yeah. and angels, he could yeah. start all over, except I think, um, I think so, what causes me to believe that that would be very difficult to happen is that God has a love for us. Yes. And, and, yeah, and, and there's something only. about his overwhelming love that... And he had made some promises <clears throat> to Adam and Eve. And he'd made some promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Well, but those promises wouldn't... That wouldn't oh, matter to God. anybody if he started over. Completely. It wouldn't yes. be him, though. Yeah, he'd it have to start... He, he'd would have have to get, he would have to get rid of all the angels. Right. He'd have to get That's rid right. of everything and start, start over. Start all over. Yeah. yeah. But he can't get rid of himself, and he would have known it was a failure. Right. Yeah. See? Well, that's so, the one. I, I can hear him. you say that and myself think it, but it's very difficult for me to comprehend some of that. But So, so yeah. it sounds like we would know why, how um, Adam would have sinned because he would have ate the fruit. Mm -hmm. So I guess you're saying that if Jesus would have sinned, everything would have fell apart. Right I, I, believe that, I believe that the whole universe, you know, when I say fall apart, I don't have a better word for it. I think that, you know, if God's government is based on love and trust, and now trust is gone. Yeah, say, I mean, uh, Satan would have said, see? Yeah, exactly. That's it. So you know, and, and, uh, and all of the... And all Satan, of the would, Satan would spend his time touring the universe saying, I was right and God was wrong. That's right. And, and all, these, all these created beings would have, you know, they'd have absolutely evidence to show you, you know, this guy's right. Okay, uh, now, now I'm seeing a little different thing. You're saying that Satan would go around to the universe and, and tell that he was right and God was wrong. But that leads me back to what would Jesus have done to show that he sinned? You're asking me, I mean, asking what, you what asking, the sin how was? How would the universe know that Jesus how had sinned? How would you know that he sinned? The whole universe would have seen it. Wow. How did we know what that? What, depend on what, depend on well, what's... because he ate the fruit. How did we know that? Well, because they told him that who, they couldn't. Who, uh, who God was... said he couldn't eat the fruit. Well, that's but a... where no. is it? Where is it that he said to Jesus, "Don't do this, or you've sinned." Well, if well, they'd bow okay. down and worship Satan, there. Here's here's, here's, in the, here's the, uh, the answer that I would give to that. Okay. The entire universe is watching this experiment not only everything that happens here on planet Earth, but especially the life and death of Jesus. The entire universe is watching every single move. They're watching everything Satan does. They're watching everything God does. We didn't see it, but they saw it. If Jesus had stepped out of line at any point, the whole universe would know just like that, instantly. So they knew what the line was. They, 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 they knew the instructions that God had given to his son, and they, if, he, if he had said, no, I'm not going to do that, or I choose to do something different, they would know instantly. The, the issue, though, is the universe is based on love. Love is, by definition, self-sacrificing. Mm -hmm. If Christ had done one thing that was selfish to benefit himself instead of the others, the universe would have known it, and that would have been his sin. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let's, let's go back to our, so let's, let's follow the sequence to here. So then, can, can I say yeah. one thing? I like the way Norm has said this sometimes before. It wasn't just Adam taking the fruit. Mm -hmm. It was Adam transferring his allegiance from the, cre from the creator to the creature in the tree, the serpent. That's right. So it was, it was not just taking yeah, the fruit. Yeah, because we yeah. have the story of them taking the fruit doesn't mean that was the only possibility of, of sin. Yeah. I mean, that there was... There lots of possibilities. Yeah. And they, well, Satan certainly managed to, Lucifer certainly managed to sin in heaven without anybody to tempt him and without any fruit. All the finite creatures are not self-existent. No. So they're dependent upon the Creator for their existence. Right. So then God could have pulled the plug, so to speak, and, 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 the, and he would be very lonely. The cohesion would have been lost. What? Yeah, the cohesion would have yeah. been lost. He would have, at, at best, he would have had a real minority. 
yeah. uh, real remnant, uh, if, he, if, if that, because the highest example was, was Jesus, and he failed. So uh, it, 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 real so, mess. So let's, let's go back to our quotation, Desire of Ages 782, paragraph 4. When Jesus was laid in the grave, Satan triumphed. He dared to hope. Now, Satan knew, honestly, that he had lost. But he said, There's, I still have one more chance. He dared to hope that the Savior would not take up his life again. He claimed the Lord's body and set his guard about the tomb. I want to make one thing very clear. We make a big deal out of the fact that an angel came down and scattered a hundred Roman soldiers. That was nothing. The entire force of Satan and all his evil angels were there guarding in every possible way they could that tomb. The, the hundred Roman soldiers, that was, that was like the toothpick at the end of the parade, you know. Uh, that was nothing compared to what was going on there. So reading on, seeking to hold Christ a prisoner. He was bitterly angry. Satan was bitterly angry when his angels fled at the approach of the heavenly messenger. God sent down, we'll, we'll read this in a moment, God sent down two angels with his power accompanying them, and Satan and his entire host just fled. They could not stand in the presence of God's glory, in the presence of, of these two angels, not God himself coming, two angels coming down. And these two angels, by the way, were the ones who had been guardian angels for Jesus for his entire life. She says that elsewhere. So he was bitterly angry when his angels fled at the approach of the heavenly messenger. When he saw Christ come forth in triumph, he knew that his kingdom would have an end and that he must finally die. That was the final, final, he knew there was not a chance beyond that. that w it was curtains at that point. Okay? So what happened? And to bring that about, two angels descend. One, now, I'm sorry, I'm turning now to page, backing up a little, page 780, the first paragraph. Desire of Ages. Two angels descend, one rolls a stone back, Gabriel calls Jesus who comes forth, an earthquake marked the hour when Christ laid down his life, and another earthquake witnessed the moment when he took it up in triumph. He who had vanquished death and the grave came forth from the tomb with the tread of a conqueror. Amid the reeling of the earth, the flashing of lightning, and the roaring of thunder. So you can see what happened. When the voice of the mighty angel reading on the next prayer, well actually this is a page 785, paragraph 2, when the voice of the mighty angel was heard at Christ's tomb, saying, Thy Father calls thee, the Savior came forth from the grave by the life that was in himself. That was your verse that you read for us, John 10. Okay? Now was proved the truth of his words, I lay down my life that I might take it again. I have power to lay it down, I have power to take it again. Now was fulfilled the prophecy he had spoken to the priests and rulers, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. John 10, 17, 18, and 2, 19. I'm going to stop there for a moment, and, and, and let's try to sink our teeth into what this really means. What was one of the arguments from Satan back at the very beginning in heaven, Lucifer? What was one of his arguments? God is arbitrary. God is arbitrary. Jesus stands over here on this side. Actually, I guess God's right, that would be over here. God, you know, Jesus stands on his, God's right hand. I stand on his left hand. Why aren't we treated exactly the same? And God said, what? <laughs> You're a creature. He's not. He's the creator. And Lucifer's response was, prove it. Prove it. Prove. I mean, he went forth. Jesus went out among the angels as who? As one of them. Michael the archangel, he, he looked like an angel, he talked like an angel, but they knew he was the one who was God's son. But they, as far as looking at him, they thought, okay, he's an angel. And Lucifer was a, an angel. So it looked like the two of them were just going out and doing the same thing, that they really were pretty much on a par. So, when Jesus is laid into the grave, he dies as... His humanity dies. His humanity dies. Now, this is something that we human beings can't fully comprehend, but he was fully God and he was fully man. Okay? So, what happens at the point of his death here as a human being, 
as humanity dies, his divinity is set aside quiescent, and he's sleeping in the tomb. Okay, are we all together on that? And in his humanity, he could lay it down. Yes. In other words, any human could do that much of the job. Theoretically. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, now, turning now to Desire of Ages 785, paragraph 3, only he who was one with God could say, I have the power to lay down my life and I have the power to take it again. In his divinity, Christ possessed the power to break the bonds of death. So what does he prove by rising from the dead? He is God. He is God. That was the last major argument that Satan... Remember Satan had said, you know, sin doesn't lead to death. Well, lots of arguments. Christ and I are, it shouldn't be any difference. This was his last sticking point. His last point. You see, Christ says, okay, I'll show you that I'm not the same as you are. Watch me rise from the dead. Just watch me. Try to keep me in, gra in that grave, you know, yeah. just try. <laughs> so, reading on, this is Desire of Ages 832, paragraph 1. And by the way, if you're interested in these uh, handouts, they will be available uh, on our website, uh, and you can look at them, the same ones we're looking at. These angels were of the company that had been waiting in a shining cloud to escort Jesus to his heavenly home. The most exalted of the angel throng they were the two who had come to the tomb at Christ's resurrection, and they had been with him throughout his life on earth. He, they were his what? Guardians. Guardian angels. He needed two of them to try to protect him from Satan. Okay? So these are the same two now have the privilege to do what? One of, the, he call, one of them rolls back the, the stone. What does the other one say? My father calls me. Your father calls you, and Jesus comes forth in his own divine power, okay? Well, there were other things that happened exactly at, this, at the same time. What, what else happened? Well, th there was a tremendous earthquake. Yes. And... Uh, now, the earthquake was at his death, wasn't it? But they're both. both. They were both death earthquakes at both. But at his death, the earthquake had opened a whole lot of graves. Mm -hmm. And during the earthquake, when he rose, people popped out of those graves. And it's, it, you can't tell from Scripture whether some people came to life at his death and then other people came to life at his resurrection or where, as you su seem to suggest, the graves were opened at his death and then they came forth from the graves at his life. At least I haven't found any verse that clearly tells us that. But anyway, in any case, by the time resurrection morning came around, there were a lot of people who had been dead a long time wandering around Jerusalem. <laughs> you wonder... You get the idea that they were saying God, Christ is risen. Mm -hmm. Were they all around him there when they arose? Did they automatically know that this was an event that happened you to know, do with Christ? There's a <laughs> if, I, if I were there as one of the disciples, I think I would want to say a whole lot about those guys. Yeah. I would want to know who it was. Was it Abraham? Was it Daniel? Was it, you know, I, I would... What happened I don't, to I, him after? That's what I would Yeah, exactly. No, they were up. Did they live? Did they go to heaven? Did they die again? Well, at least some of them went to heaven. But they were witnesses on yeah. earth before they went to heaven. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've got a little bit of a question here. This is a, this is a pretty remarkable event here. Absolutely. An understatement. And, uh, I mean, we've got one guy that comes forth from the tomb, and there are 100 guards there who witness this, Roman soldiers. And, it was and done then two evil angels, right? And and then we've and got the entire universe. Then we've got a bunch of other people who've been resurrected from the dead. Mm -hmm. Doesn't it seem odd that there's no record of this any place other than here? It seemed like, I mean, the Romans weren't completely illiterate. It seemed like somebody would have written down, you know, just like they keep records of earthquakes and uh, and an eclipse, <coughs> solar eclipse. You would have thought somebody else would have kept a record of, uh, mentioned it somewhere that, by the way, it, there was an odd thing happened in Jerusalem. <laughs> <laughs> a bunch of people that yeah. were running around and yeah. had been dead for some time. Do we have extra biblical record of the resurrection at all? 
Well, you know, that's that I I mean you don't think we do, do some we? some people would say, you know, that's that's another proof that this is all a bunch of hokum in here. This is just a bunch of We're gonna talk oral that. tradition that somebody wrote this down and uh, you know, you can't we're going to talk about all the different theories that have come up, so just hang on to that one for a little bit, okay? And, and w about the people who rose from the grave, the graves are open, it's just one gospel that says that, isn't there? Mm -hmm. So if it's such a great important thing, how come everybody didn't mention it all through with all the gospels? Oh, you, you said only one gospel mentions it? Yeah. One of the gospels mention it? Um, I mean, it's I all. That, it's basically, it's basically in one one of the books. I yeah. can't remember which one it was. Or cer certainly, the Old Testament yeah. said it was going to happen. Yeah. Said these things were going to happen, but you know, there's just no other reports. It seems kind of. Well, Ellen White does say some other things about it. Let's let's look at some. How of about those. the fact? Do you need any other anybody else to come from the grave in order to witness, to change a person's mind? Mm-hmm. He says, even if some, even if, uh, how, how's that Lazarus. go? Oh, yeah. Even if someone rose from the dead, you're not going to believe. No. You know, if they won't, if they won't believe what Moses and the prophets had to teach, bringing somebody else from the grave. So anyway, maybe he's inconsistent there. I think it's consistent. Okay, coming back there, as Christ arose, he brought from the grave a multitude of captives. The earth, earthquake at his death had rent open their graves, and when he arose, they came forth with him. Now that would seem to support. What yeah. you su the, the, the scenario that you suggested. They were those who had been co-laborers with God and who at the cost of their lives had borne testimony to the truth. Now they were to be witnesses for him who, has raised, who had raised them from the dead. Now does this mean these were Old Testament martyrs? It sort probably, of sounds probably. like that, doesn't it? At least that's a good candidate. <laughs> yeah, that was Desire of Ages 786.1. Now we go to the next paragraph. During his ministry, uh, Jesus had raised the dead to life. He had raised the son of the widow of Nain and the ruler's daughter and Lazarus, but these were not clothed with immortality. After they were raised, they were still subject to death. But those who came forth from the grave at Christ's resurrection were raised to everlasting life. Carrie, this is your, your question. They ascended with him as trophies of the a victory over death and the grave. These, said Christ, are no longer the captives of Satan. And who were the captives of Satan? The dead, right? Yeah. Satan claimed them as his. Lazarus, you know, the Lazarus being raised back to life shortly before mm -hmm. Jesus' uh, death and resurrection. He kind of speculated, man, we kind of need to be gone to heaven. Yeah. I don't know. Now, what do you think the purpose of this was, as far as the whole picture goes, that these people would raise up with Jesus to everlasting life at that time? Well, we're, part we're, of it we're is given a picture in Revelation of, a, of an area where there are thrones and people sat on them. There's yeah. 20. There's, there's only a few, though. Well, I, there's I, not a multitude. Yeah, well, yeah. I don't know that every one of them has to have a throne. I think the Bible, doesn't the Bible pr predict some first fruits? And aren't these yes. people the, the first fruits sure, of that? So it's, described. you know, it's kind of the first taste of the evidence of, of what, you know, really going to happen. I, I think that's the main reason they're there to prove that it's going to be safe for God to resurrect human beings, people like you and me, and for them to live forever in heaven without starting the great controversy all over again. Now we're going to have to take a break in just a second. Gordon, did you want to say something? I just wanted to give the reference for the graves opening. That's Matthew 27, 51 to 53. Okay, very good. So we're going to see what happens next in just a moment. So don't go away. We will be right back.
Welcome back. We're so glad you decided to stay with us. We're discussing probably the most important day in the history of huma humanity, possibly with the exception of what happened a couple days before. Uh, we're talking about the day of the cru crucifixion and now the day of the resurrection. We have been talking about the implications, and now we've talked about the group of people that were raised at the time of Christ's resurrection and what happened to them. If you turn, if you happen to have a, a copy of the book Desire of Ages, page 786, I'm going to read paragraph 3 in, on, that, on that page. These went into the city, this is the people who rose with Jesus, went into the city and appeared unto many, declaring Christ has risen from the dead, and we be risen with him. Now I would have thought that that would have stirred up a hornet's nest uh, in the city. The, thus were immortalized the sacred truth of the resurrection. The risen saints bore witness to the truth of the words, Thy dead men shall live, together with my dead body shall they arise. This was predicted in the Old Testament. Um, their resurrection was an illustration of the fulfillment of the prophecy, Awake and sing, ye that dwell in dust, for thy dew is as the dew of the herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. Isaiah 26:19. Well, much of that we don't have witnessed in Scripture, only a little bit, pieces here and there. But the next part we do, and that's Desire of Ages 780, paragraph 2. Yes. Can we read the text from Matthew 27, yes. 51 to 53? Please. Then the curtain hanging in the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split apart, the graves broke open, and many of God's people who had died were raised to life. They left the graves, and after Jesus rose from death, they went into the holy city where many people saw them. Yes. So that's the scriptural basis that Ellen White expanded yeah, on. Exactly. <clears throat> Question? Yes. Okay. The fact that they went and said Jesus has risen, does that imply that they had died in the last three years or so? No, I think that they rose with an understanding that this is particularly why they were rising at this time. I, I suspect that the guardian angel of each one of those persons was right there when they came out. And they may have well have had a good conversation and the angel told them what was going on. Yeah. Probably yeah. surprised to be up and around. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if one of them was John the Baptist who... Yeah. Was oh, you would sure hope so, wouldn't yeah. you? Yeah. Well, at the death of Jesus, now I'm turning to page Desire of Ages 780, paragraph 2. At the death of Jesus, the soldiers had beheld the earth wrapped in darkness at midday and heard the inhabitants of heaven singing with great joy. I'm sorry, but at the resurrection they saw the brightness of the angels illuminate the night and heard the inhabitants of heaven singing with great joy and triumph. Thou hast vanquished Satan in the powers of darkness. Thou hast swallowed up death and victory. Now this says that the angels heard what? I mean, I'm sorry, the, the, the Roman soldiers heard what? They heard the, the angels the singing. singing. Yeah. I mean, do you think they went home and kept quiet about that? They were blabbering about it all the way into town until the Pharisees got a hold of them. Well, but even after the Pharisees <laughs> got a hold of them, I mean, they may have told a lie for a little while, but I don't think they told a lot no, forever. No, not very long. Well, reading on, next page. Christ came forth from the tomb glorified, and the Roman guard beheld him. They saw him. Their eyes were riveted upon the face of him whom they had so recently mocked and derided. I mean, this is the guy they had just pounded on in attached to a, a cross, right? And this glorified being, they beheld the prisoner whom they had seen in the judgment hall, the one for whom they had plaited a crown of thorns. At sight of the angels and the glorified Savior, the Roman guard had fainted and became as dead men. You wonder if some of them were dead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, He's scared to death, I guess. When the heavenly train was hidden from their view, they arose to their feet and as quickly as their trembling limbs could carry them, hurried on, to, uh, made their way, I'm sorry, to the gate of the garden. Staggering like drunken men, they hurried on to the city, telling those whom they met the wonderful news. Now, who was ra racing into the city faster, the people who rose with Jesus or these guys? 
Good question. Yeah. They were making their way to Pilate, but their report had been carried to the Jewish authorities, and the chief priests and rulers sent for them to be brought first into their presence. A strange appearance these soldiers presented. How far did they have to go to get into, about, the, uh, into the city from where they were? Well, there's, there's, a, there's an argument about where the crucifixion and the yeah. burial took place. In any case, it was no more than about a half a mile, max. But there were many, many people in Jerusalem at this many, time. Many, many, probably a couple million people in Jerusalem. So they were going literally through a crowd for that half mile, telling everybody what was going on. I bet their progress was relatively slow. And the people are wondering, you know, how come these Roman soldiers are staggering like drunk men? But that would give plenty of opportunity for light-footed spies to make it back to the, yeah. to the priests. Yeah, yeah. So, um, a strange appearance these soldiers presented, trembling with fear, their faces colorless. They bore testimony to the resurrection of Christ. The fear, I'm sorry, the soldiers told all, just as they had seen it. They had not had time to think or speak anything but the truth. With painful utterance, they said, it was the Son of God who was crucified. We have heard an angel proclaiming him as the majesty of heaven, the king of glory, and the high priest said, hmm, isn't that interesting? What do you think the high priest said when that message came to him? You gotta be kidding. <laughs> he was, he, I'm sure he was, his heart rate must have been 300. He was completely nonplussed. He just didn't know, I mean, what in the world, well, reading on, it, it, we talk about it. Um, the priests in putting Christ to death and made themselves, now I'm, I'm turning now to Desire of Ages 785.1. The priests in putting Christ to death had made themselves the tools of Satan. Now they were entirely in his power. They were entangled in a snare from which they saw no escape, but in continuing their warfare against Christ. When they heard the report of his resurrection, they feared the wrath of the people. I, I would have preferred some other things more than the wrath of the people. <laughs> they felt that their own lives were in danger. The only hope for them was to prove Christ an imposter by denying that he had risen. They bribed the soldiers and secured Pilate's silence. They spread their lying, by the way, that means Christ, I'm, I'm sorry, Pilate knew the truth. Did he tell anybody? Did he tell his wife after what she had said to him, remember? Yeah, the dream and all, yeah. Uh, Boy, you can bet that he came back and he, you know, w would you be embarrassed to tell your wife after you'd done what she told you not to do? Would you try to keep quiet about it? Or would you say, you won after all, honey, he's, he's alive again? <laughs> Didn't he fall from grace not that long ago? Yeah, later? he did. Yes, he did, yeah. He did. I've often wondered why Josephus never mentions it. He sure has a whole lot of stuff in his writings yeah. and you'd think that would have caught his attention. They spread their lying report, reports far and near, but there were witnesses whom they could not silence. Many had heard of the soldiers' testimony to Christ's resurrection. Norm, there's your story. Yeah. And certain of the dead who came forth with Christ appeared to many and declared that he had risen. Reports were brought to the priests of persons who had seen these risen ones and heard their testimony. The priests and rulers were in continual dread, lest in walking the streets or within the privacy of their own homes, they should come face to face with Christ. They felt that there was no safety for them. Bolts and bars were but poor protection against the Son of God. By day and night, by night, the, uh, that awful scene in the judgment hall when they cried, His blood be on us and on our children, was before them. Matthew 27, 25. Nevermore would the memory of that scene fade from their minds. Nevermore would peaceful sleep come to their pillows. By the way, the reference in the Bible for this, the report to the guards, is uh, Matthew 28, 11 to 15. Okay. Okay. Now, what did Christ do between his resurrection and his ascension? He appeared to he lots of people. A few people. Yeah. <laughs> I've also made a little handout on that. Um, there were ten distinct resurrection appearances of Christ prior to his dissension, his ascension, I'm sorry, 
and there's one that happened afterwards, and we'll talk about that in a moment. So let's talk about what were those sequences. Number one, the first person he appeared to was Mary, Mary Magdalene. The women had all, and now I'm reading from Desire Bages, seven, Desire Bages, page 788, paragraph 3. The woman, women had not all come to the tomb from the same direction. Mary Magdalene was the first to reach the place, and upon seeing that the stone was removed, she hurried away to tell the disciples. So the women had agreed to do what? Take possession of his body. And well, it, yeah. only, if, only if it was necessary. Right. Yeah. They had come to honor him. They wanted to put spices on his body. That was the main thing. They were bringing special things to honor him in his death. Yes. Okay. They came from different directions. Mary was ahead of the other women a but little. They were minus one alabaster box. They were minus an alabaster box. That's right. Well, meanwhile, the other women came up. She, so Mary sees that the tomb was open and it's empty. So she races where? To tell the disciples. To tell the disciples. And where are they? In yeah. hiding. In hiding in the upper room. I'm mm -hmm. sorry. I wonder if she still had the, some of the smell of that alabaster on her. Yeah, right. From a week earlier? <laughs> yeah. Possible. Pretty strong stuff. Yeah, it is. <laughs> So meanwhile, the other woman came up. A light was shining. Uh, now this is Desire of Ages 788, the next paragraph, point three. A light was shining about the tomb, but the body of Jesus was not there. As they lingered about the place, suddenly they saw that they were not alone. A young man clothed in shining garments was sitting by the tomb. It was the angel who had rolled away the stone. He had taken the guise of humanity that he might not alarm these friends of Jesus. Yet about him the light of the heavenly glory was still shining, and the women were afraid. They turned to flee, but the angel's words stayed their steps. Fear not ye, he said, for I know that ye seek Jesus, who was cru which was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen as he said. Come, see the place where the Lord lay, and go qu quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. Now, Mary is ahead, and she says, the tomb is empty. Now the other women have told, go, tell them, he, they saw an angel, go and tell the disciples that he's risen from the dead. Now they have been given a supernatural message, right? Okay. Has anyone seen Jesus yet? Any humans? No. No. The, the other women had seen the angels, but they hadn't seen Jesus. Okay? Now look at, at John 20, verses 1 and 2. Maybe we should just read that very quickly. John chapter 20, verses 1 and 2. Early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been taken away from the entrance. She went running to Simon Peter and the other disciple whom Jesus loved and told them, they have taken the Lord from the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. Okay. Mary, I'm reading now from Desire of Ages 789, paragraph 2, Mary had not heard the good news. She went to Peter and John with the sorrowful message, they have taken away the Lord out of the sepulchre, and we, not, we know not where they have laid him. Now, what did she have in mind? Well, she was going to try to find him. She was going to try to find him. What is she going to do with him? Do you know? He was going to put Remember? spices. What? Wasn't she going to try to find a proper there, burial? Too? Well, oh, oh, think about it for a moment here. There was a tomb, an empty tomb, over by her house. Who the used Lazarus. to be there? Oh, Lazarus' tomb. Uh -huh. She says, if this rich man's tomb is too nice for Jesus, I can take his body and I know exactly where I'm going to take it. Yeah. Ellen White says that. Okay. So what happens next? John 23 to 10, the disciples, Peter and John, hurried to the tomb and found it as Mary had said. They saw the shroud and the napkin, but they did not find their Lord. Nobody has yet seen Jesus, right? Yet even here was the testimony that he had risen. The grave clothes were not thrown heedlessly aside, but carefully folded each in a place by, place by itself. Now, if someone had come charging in there, somehow or others chased away the Roman guard, grab the body of Jesus, would they worry about carefully folding up the... Probably not. Probably not. Okay. John, quote, saw and believed. So who's the first one who really believed? Well, we don't know for sure whether the women believed or not. They were told. 
John now John says now I believe has been has John been told at this point but no all he saw was he took a look and and there's things carefully folded and there's things folded and he says so he went back in his mind to the things that Jesus said about his resurrection pulled that together and believed it goes on to say, He did not yet understand the scripture that Christ must rise from the dead, but now he remembered the Savior's words foretelling his resurrection. So now then we come to Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16 and verse 9. We're going to see something that might seem like a contradiction here, so let's look at it carefully. Mark 16 verse 9. Okay. After Jesus rose from death, early on Sunday morning, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, from whom he had driven out seven demons. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mary had followed, and now I'm, I'm turning back now to John 20, verse 15, as one of the places. Mary had followed John and Peter to the tomb. So they raced, and I'm sure they were moving faster than she did, but she followed them. When they returned to Jerusalem, she remained. Remained where? At the tomb, right? Another voice addressed her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? Through her tear-dimmed eyes, Mary saw the form of a man, and thinking that it was the gardener, she said, Sir, if thou have borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. John 20, 15. But now in his own familiar voice, Jesus said to her, Mary, or Mary, now she knew that it was not a stranger who was addressing her, and turning she saw before her the living Christ. Now this is the first appearance to a human being after the resurrection, right? In her joy, she forgot that he had been crucified. Springing toward him as if to embrace his feet, she said, Rabboni, which is the familiar form of teacher. But Christ raised his hand, saying, Do not detain me, or I'm sorry, detain me not, for I am not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father and to my God and your God. John 20, 17. And Mary went her way to the disciples with the joyful message. Now, the women have been sent to, to give the message. They got the message from whom? The angels. From the angels. Mary goes now with the message sent from Jesus, Jesus himself. Okay? So now look at Mark 16, verses 10 and 11. She went and told his companions. They were mourning and crying, and when they heard her say that Jesus was alive and that she had seen him, they did not believe her. So apparently they hadn't believed the women either. Right? Well, they didn't see the evidence either. No, no. I mean, admittedly. But, I mean, these were their companions. These were people they, they worked with every day. They saw, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. To just flatly call them liars very good news, is it? Well, was, you know, you get emotional and you say all kinds of <laughs> things. So, Well, turn now to Matthew 28, verses 8 to 10. I'm reading from my Good News Bible. So they, that is the other women, left the tomb in a hurry, afraid and yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly, Jesus met them and said, Peace be with you. They came up to him, took hold of his feet, and worshipped him. Do not be afraid, Jesus said to them. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. Now, apparently, Jesus appeared to these women as they're on the way to see the disciples. Is that what it seems to imply? Mm -hmm. yeah. So, was that before or after Mary? Well, it's hard to know for sure. Why were these able to touch him? Yeah, good question. Apparently, Jesus didn't let them do it for very long. Yes. They were all able to touch him. Mm -hmm. the, probably the correct translation of even Mary is don't keep on t touching yeah, me, don't, don't detain, detain me. me. The, the, the Greek can, is, is very, very clear in that respect. Um, there's two ways to say don't do something in Greek. One, one way is basically don't start doing it, and the other way is don't keep on doing it. So Mary touched Jesus, I'm sure. And but which way is the verse? It's don't keep on doing it. So Mary, I'm sure, touched him. He said, Rabboni, just as like these women had touched him. But he said, no, not for a long time. You know, I need to go. Which is an important point also, because what had Jesus said to the thief on the cross that, 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 became, that turned to him and said, 
you know, remember me and when you come in your kingdom, what did he, what he had said to him? Depends on where you put the comma. Okay, so where are you going to put the comma? Today. In this one, you put it after. <laughs> I say unto you today, comma, comma, you will be with me in paradise. He couldn't have said today you'll be with me in paradise because that would have been a lie. He clearly said here, I have not yet ascended to my Father. Right. Now, some of our Catholic friends solved that problem by inventing another place, which is not supported anywhere else in Scripture, right. called paradise. And they say Jesus went to that other place. He didn't go to God. He went to this other place, and he preached to people who were over there dead, the spirits dead over there. And they read First uh, Peter 3:19 as a support of that. But uh, that's that's really grasping at straws and making up stories. So Jesus refused to receive. Now I'm reading Desire of Ages 790.4. I'm sorry, point three. Jesus refused to receive the homage of his people until he had the assurance that his sacrifice was accepted by the Father. Now, Jesus had been following the Father's instructions step by step, basically from his birth to his resurrection. And now he said, I'm gonna, I'm, I want to get up to heaven. I want to return to my glorious situation. I want to hear it in all its glory. I want to know that we succeeded in what we set out to do. But we have no record of any communication between he and the Father after the separation. The Father separated from him at the cross. At the cross. And there is no, no record of them talking again no. until he goes up there to find out how it went. Yeah. Reading on. Um, that his atonement for the sins of man had been ample, that through his blood all might gain eternal life. The Father ratified the covenant made with Christ. He said, yes, it worked. That he would receive repentant and obedient men and would love them even as he loves his Son. Christ was to complete his work and fulfill his pledge to make a man more precious than fine gold, even a man than the golden wedge of Ophir, Isaiah 13, 12. All power in heaven and on earth was given to the Prince of Life, and he returned to his followers in a world of sin that he might impart to them of his power and glory. While the Savior was in God's presence, receiving gifts for his church, the disciples thought upon his empty tomb and mourned and wept. The day that was a day of rejoicing to all heaven was to the disciples a day of uncertainty, confusion, and perplexity. It didn't need to be, Mm. but it was. Their unbelief in the testimony of the women gives evidence of how low their faith had sunk. The news of Christ's resurrection was so different from what they had anticipated that they could not believe it. It was too good to be true, they thought. They had heard so much of the doctrines, and listen to this carefully, they had heard so much of the doctrines and the so-called scientific theories of the Sadducees who didn't believe that you could rise from the dead. That was one of their key doctrines that the impression made on their minds in regard to the resurrection was vague. You would have thought that three and a half years Jesus would have been able to straighten that out, right? They scarcely knew what the resurrection from the dead could mean. They were unable to take in the great subject. Unbelievable. It's our page is 790, paragraph 4. Well then, and we don't have time, we're running out of time, but you know what happened next in, as far as in the story? Jesus walks with those two men to, on the road to Emmaus. And what happens when they get to Emmaus? He offers to bless the bread and they recognize in his hands the marks and suddenly they realize it was Jesus. But they had heard very clearly in that journey all the details from the Old Testament proving that he was the Messiah and this is exactly what was supposed to happen to the Messiah. And when they went back, They were loaded with all the information. Do we have a time frame for that trip to Emmaus and back? Well, Ellen White suggests that by the time they got ready to come back, it was getting dark. It was dark. They were tripping over the stones. Dark of resurrection day. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sunday evening. If he has a glorified body at this time, how is he? How? Why does he still have those marks of nail prints and to remind you and me of what he went through? going to have them for eternity. Mm-hmm. Well, 
1 Corinthians 15, 5, that he appeared to Peter and then to all 12 apostles. Why didn't Jesus make, and here's my question to think about, and for all of you out there, if Jesus wanted to prove, I mean, this is, this is obviously in a debate. There are very few people who actually believe, other than Christians, and, and even a lot of Christians who aren't quite sure if Jesus actually rose from the dead. Maybe he got out of the dead somehow or other. But why didn't Jesus make a grand entrance to the temple? I mean, this is Passover Sunday, okay? The great, I mean, the huge gathering, millions of people in Jerusalem. Why didn't Jesus just show up at the temple and say, are there any questions? Here I am. Bam. Why didn't he even hover above the courtyard? Everybody could see him and no one could touch him. Whatever, I, I, whatever he chose. That would have given sanction to the, to the temple again, and that was left desolate. Yeah. The, and I, you'd already told the, the reason clear back at the time of the uh, story of the rich man and Lazarus. Yes. If you won't believe Moses and the prophets, even if somebody comes from the dead. Yeah, exactly. Well, I think it would have turned it into a big event that would be more important than the truth, mm -hmm. the underlying truth. Figure out how to sell tickets. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I'm just going to review the appearances of Christ <laughs> in, in between his, his resurrection and his ascension. And then, as a part of our discussion of the book of Acts, next week, we're going to talk about different ideas have been people have tried to give to explain the quote resurrection so he first appeared to mary magdalene then he appeared to the women we've talked about that already then he appeared to peter we mentioned that then he appeared to those disciples approaching emmaus in the evening we, we've just talked about then then he appeared to all the disciples uh, that's clearly spelled out luke 24 36 to 43 and john 20 19 to 23 uh, except thomas who wasn't present the, the following week, at the end of Passover week, he appeared to all the disciples, including Thomas. Um, then he appeared to seven disciples beside the Sea of Galilee, John 21, 1 to 25. Then he appeared to more than 500 people on an appointed mountain in Galilee, Matthew 28, 16 to 20, and possibly parallel to 1 Corinthians 15, 6. Then he appeared to James, the half-brother of Jesus. We don't know exactly when that happened. It's mentioned in 1 Corinthians 15, 7. Then to the apostles at the ascension itself, Acts 1, 3 to 11, and finally to Paul himself in vision at some point, 1 Corinthians 15, 8. See you next week.